This is Professor Jameson. Uh, this lecture will be a supplement to Chapter 9 of the book, which you should have been reading uh, this week. I will normally post uh, lectures such as this at the um, beginning of the week, but for the first week I wanted to do it actually at the end because uh, hopefully most of you have done your questions already and submitted those, and I kind of wanted to see what <clears throat> your responses would be and how well you dis digested the chapter. And then next week I'll post the video earlier in the week. Now, when I do these lectures, please understand, they are not a substitute for the text. Uh, you need to read the test because that's how you're going to do well on the exams. I'm not going to test you on anything I say in these videos that are not in the test text. What I recommend that you do is read the text first and see what you get out of it and then come back watch the video lecture. It'll be a good review, maybe make an outline, whatever, and um, you know, uh, supplement your understanding. Hopefully these lectures will clear up any misunderstandings that you might have about the text because it you know, textbooks aren't the most fun to read and they can be confusing. For a lot of you, this is new stuff. So uh, to that extent, uh, I'm going to try to try to kind of get put my spin on the chapters and tell you what I think is important, um, things like that. OK, uh, we'll start out. Uh, uh, I, we all have different uh, versions of the, of the book. And so I'm just going to refer to it by the um, actual chapter headings themselves as opposed to a particular page. Okay. I'm going to start out by talking about the importance of good legal writing. Okay. Why is it important? Why should you take this class? Why does it really matter? Well, the main reason that legal, uh, legal writing is important as an attorney is because other attorneys judge me and I judge other attorneys based upon their writing. Okay. From TV, you would get the... Um, the impression that's all about legal oral argument in the court and thinking quick on your feet. In reality, good lawyers plan ahead and they try to have the battle won before it gets to a showdown. And uh, just me as an attorney who's practiced for you know 20 years and was a civil litigator for about 10 of those 20 years, um, when product comes into my office from other attorneys and it's poor, I don't really take that attorney seriously. Okay, so you have to understand that attorneys judge each other based upon the paperwork. And the larger the city you're in, the more important it is because you're less likely to deal with an attorney on a face-to-face -face personal basis on, on more than one case. Um, so it's critically important that the product we put out of the office is quality product. Okay, uh, if we put uh, uh, stuff uh, out there that isn't, our clients will lose confidence in us. Other attorneys won't respect us. And also really important is judges. Okay, One of the things I'm going to teach you in this class is we want to make things as easy as possible and simple for the judges as we can. Okay, They're very busy people. This might shock you, but they're not going to read everything an attorney writes. A lot of times they're just going to read the headings. But we want to get a reputation for putting quality product out there to when we're when we're submitting documents for the court, when we're submitting documents that judges will read, okay? Because uh, when you practice in a mid-sized town like I did, and still to an extent do, um, the uh, uh, the judges know who I are. For example, here in Kern County, uh, when I used to do civil litigation cases in Superior Court, I was before the th same three judges all the time. If they know that they can trust what I'm saying, um, that adds a little bit more credibility and really helps my client a little bit more. To give you an example of uh, how much uh, lawyers value good legal reading and writing, uh, I'm going to take about two minutes here and tell a war story, which I usually don't do, but I think it's really important to uh, to you. So if you want to just fast forward two minutes and war stories bore you, uh, then go ahead and, and fast forward. I'm not going to be uh, uh, you know offended or anything, and it's not going to be on the test. But when I was a young attorney, I worked at Klein Intel in Goldner which is a uh, Bakersfield's largest law firm. And one of the um, attorneys I was lucky enough to work for was Barry Goldner. Okay? Now, in my opinion, Barry Goldner is one of the best business litigation attorneys in Bakersfield. He's the kind of attorney that if I was in a jam, he'd be the first person I would probably think about hiring. Okay? 
Barry Golden is a great attorney. Um, but I want to tell you a little story about uh, a situation where I kind of got into it with Barry. Um, when you worked on Barry's cases, anything that went out of the office had to be run by his desk. And one day, um, a friend of his had contacted me about finding an expert witness for a case. And he found us a really good expert witness that we needed for one of our cases. And Barry told me, write a thank you letter to my friend for, um, for finding us this expert witness. So I go to my office, I dictate the letter. And one of the sentences, you know, it's a blah, 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 thank you. Uh, uh, and I said, uh, Mr. Smith or whatever the guy's name is eminently qualified to testify as an expert witness in this case. Now, where the problem occurred was, is when I used the word eminently, my secretary typed the word eminently, okay? And when I proofread it, I didn't, I didn't notice it. And it, uh, it went, and then the copy went to Barry's desk. And uh, Barry came into my office and he said, listen, you need to make sure your, your secretary is spell checking the work. Because when I read, when he, when he showed me the, the draft of the letter, it said imminently, I-M-E-N-E-N-T-L-Y. Okay. And so he walks out of my office and, and I go to my secretary and I said, did you spell check this? And she said, yeah. And so we spell checked it again on the computer and imminently, I-M-E-N-T-L-Y, came up as a word. And it means naturally. Can also mean immediately, but in this situation, it meant naturally. Okay, so I go back to Barry and I say, Barry, um, actually, imminently is a word. It means naturally. So if our expert is naturally qualified, then it makes sense. And he looks at me and says, Yeah, but that's not what you meant. And he gave the paper back to me and told me to change it, and, and off I went. Okay, so but the reason I tell you the story is just because. You know, lawyers are very, very serious about the quality of the product coming out of their office. So um, always use spell check. That's, that's I guess, the, uh, the moral of the story there. Let's take a few minutes and talk about the ethical obligations of a lawyer when he is doing uh, legal research and writing and, and uh, present, more importantly, presenting cases or law to a court. The first rule that you have to understand is if there is a case, court case, reported published case, that is what we call on point, which means it's factually similar, and is controlling, which means the court must follow that. Okay, Usually a decision uh, that is directly above them in the, in the court system they must follow. Uh, you should have learned that in legal research, but uh, I'll save that for another time. Uh, if there's a case that's directly on point, which means factually similar, and the court must follow because it's from a court directly above them, you must, even if it hurts your client, even if you're a dead loser, if they find out about this case, you must bring it to the court's attention. What you cannot do when you find stuff that is bad for your client is pretend that it doesn't exist. Okay. Now, there are things we can do to minimize the impact. For example, we can distinguish it on its facts. Uh, we can say that, uh, I don't know, the case is 100 years old, you shouldn't follow it anymore. Whatever it might be, um, there are also ways to handle it. Normally, what I'm going to teach you when we write motions is when we have bad law, we bury it in the middle. But... We'll, we'll save that for another day. But you must bring adverse authority to the court's attention, even if the other side doesn't. And that's really important as an attorney, because like I said, I practice a lot of times before the same judges. And if I got a reputation of playing, playing loose, loosey-goosey with the law, my credibility would get hurt. Okay, so we have to bring adverse authority to the court's attention, even if it hurts our client. We are, we are, we are you know, representatives of our clients, but we're also officers of the court. And what a judge hates worse than anything is making a ruling on a motion or on some point of law, and then the case going to appeal and getting reversed because there was some case out there that pretty much everybody knew about, but I, you didn't bring to the judge's attention. Okay, So it's very important that we do that. Now, with that being said, 
if we're not in a courtroom, if I'm just dealing with another attorney, do you think I'm going to let him know that there's a case out there that's going to make my client a slam dunk loser? No way. The other attorney can do his own research. Okay. Now, if I'm before the court, that's different. But I'm for another. If I if I'm just dealing with another attorney, and I know the law may, might not be in my favor, I'm not going to tell him about that. I'm not going to do his legal research for him. It's his job to do that. So it's not unethical when I'm dealing with another attorney, but it's definitely unethical if I don't do it when I'm before the court. Okay. Most of the cases in Chapter Nine. Now I want you to read the cases that are in there, but I'm going to tell you that particularly for you people that haven't taken legal research. You have to learn to see what a case looks like, okay, and how judges decide things and what the thinking process is. Okay. But unless I specifically tell you to read a particular case, I will not test you on the facts of a case. For example, uh, uh, one of the cases is uh, Massey versus uh, Prince George's County. Okay, I'm not going to ask you on the test what happened in that case. Now, if there's a rule of law, for example, an attorney must disclose adverse authority uh, that he's aware of, that is on point, um, I might test you on that. But I'm not going to ask you what happened in a particular case. I really think it's important, though, that you do read these cases because um, a lot of you are very new to reading cases. And you have to like read lots of cases to kind of see how legal argument works and see how judges think. Okay, so please, please take the time, you know, you're spending your money to be here, to read those cases, particularly those of you that are new uh, to uh, legal research and writing. Okay, now why are these ethical rules important to you as a paralegal? Uh, the main reason is because your attorney is responsible for any, um, anything that you do as a paralegal or a legal secretary or whatever. All work on the law must be done under the supervision of an attorney, which is why you have to do a good job. Because your attorney cannot go to the court, or the client even more so, and say, oh, my paralegal screwed up, or my secretary screwed up. Uh, the court's response is going to be, well, you know, you're responsible for their work product. Okay, so the ethical rules indirectly, although you cannot be disciplined by the state bar as a paralegal or a legal secretary, the ethical rules apply to you because your attorney is responsible for pretty much anything that uh, you do. And you'll soon be out of a job if you start violating the ethical rules. Okay, okay I'm going to jump now to the part of the chapter that talks about writing as communication. Okay, the goal, obviously, of writing is to communicate. But what does that really mean? Okay, What it means in the legal sense is we have to consider our audience. Okay, For example, if I'm explaining tort law to a six-year-old, I'm going to use different language and different concepts than if I was explaining it to a law student. Okay, That only makes sense. So the number one rule in terms of, of writing and communication is to consider your audience. Okay, For example, if we're writing to a client, uh, generally we want to use more simple language unless they happen to be an, a sophisticated businessman or uh, somebody like that. But for, for general clients, like most of my personal injury clients, the goal is to write things as simple as possible because the greatest writing in the world is really ineffective if the readers don't understand it. You want to write, in my opinion, more like Ernest Hemingway in simple sentences than Marcel Proust, okay, who's like the greatest French writer and he writes sentences that are like three pages long. Okay, We want to generally write to our audience in as simple a way as possible because our goal is really to communicate with them, okay, not to dazzle them with our legal brilliance. Okay, When we get into motions, you're going to see me say the same thing. The simpler and shorter we can make a motion, the better, okay? Because the goal is to make the job, the judge's job, easier. 